Hi, my name is Leighton. I'm an intuitive and a mystic. And last week I had uploaded a video where I was mainly covering the physiological and biochemical causes of self-harm, but also the metaphysical causes, because I just don't really feel like that's something that is spoken about hardly at all. In fact, when I was researching the topic, it was really difficult for me to find anything, and I felt like it was just important to kind of give my two cents. So after I posted the video, I actually got a lot of questions. Some of the questions were kind of asking the same thing in different words, and I thought these were really great questions, and I wanted to create another video to answer them. I just want to give the disclaimer and say that I don't know everything. Um, you know, the answers that I'm going to be giving here are a little bit of my own things that I've kind of picked up intuitively from my own experience, along with a little bit of things I've pulled from Edgar Casey or Rudolf Steiner, because I feel like it helps add context that just wouldn't otherwise be there. So I have notes like all over my wall. So if I look distracted or if I'm looking around or anything, it's because um, there's a lot to talk about and I'm kind of newer to making longer videos. So I wanna make sure that I don't forget anything because these questions were really important to me. They were really moving to me. I heard a lot of stories that brought me to tears and made me feel very, very motivated to make this video and hopefully provide some answers and peace of mind. So the very first question was, and this, I, I was like, this is such a good question. Does self-harm or cutting prevent etherization of the blood? So there's so much that could be said about this. Um, etherization moves from the heart to the brain. So the thing that's interesting about this is that we are going to kind of etherize with um, or according to whatever our impulse is directed at. So in order to etherize with or according to Christ, we, we really have to be activated in the heart. And the reason why I liked this question so much is because I feel like it immediately reminded me of um, my NDE. So for those of you who don't know, I used to be a drug addict and I stopped being a drug addict because I overdosed. I had a near death experience and that near death experience changed my life. <laughs> and I woke up the next day, just a different person and flushed all the drugs, went to rehab and here we are. Well, in my NDE, I had a really interesting experience. You know, a lot of people talk about in their near-death experience, like, oh, I went up to heaven or I saw angels and, and all of that stuff. That was not my experience. Um, I actually used to feel very self-conscious of this when people would ask me what my experience was because I was like, why did they have like such a good experience? And I was like, mine was really bizarre. I, I was like reprimanded in a way and it was really weird. But honestly, I genuinely believe that we are given exactly what we need. So essentially what happened with my NDE is that, and this is kind of graphic and, and weird, but I was in this like darkness, just this all encompassing darkness, but there was a light on my body and I was like completely naked, I guess, because I was looking down and, you know, I can see my arms and legs and my torso, everything. And I had all of these holes all over my body and ticks like the bug, the blood, the blood sucking menace. <laughs> they were just pouring out of me. It was a very disturbing visual and um, something that I will never forget. So essentially I am having these like gaping holes all over my body. Ticks are pouring out of me. It's like really gross and disturbing. And I don't know if it was that I necessarily heard audibly this voice or if I just kind of knew what it was saying. Like if I was hearing it internally, it was, it's really hard to explain, but basically I, I knew that I was dead 
And I had um, this this voice, whatever, wherever it was coming from. You know, it wasn't like this gold light and this super loving feeling where I felt amazing or anything like that. But it also didn't feel bad. It was it was pretty neutral, to be honest. And it said to me, everything that you are filling your life with is sucking the life out of you. And that's what the holes in, in my body and the ticks represented was that I, you know, was doing drugs. I was um, also addicted to like stealing and I, I was really bad about that. And um, I was engaged in um, like reckless sexual activity, all kinds of things that were really, really bad for me. And I was on a ton of medication at the time. I was cutting and self-harming. And I, uh, the, you know, those before um, I had had that experience, I had kind of seen those things from this material standpoint. And I didn't really have the um, context to to see what how anything was affecting me spiritually. Um, for those of you who don't know, my, my only spiritual experience up until that point was a religious cult that was very strict, very legalistic. And I, I didn't really have any like spiritual experience outside of that, outside of the experiences that I had had myself and really shut down when I was a child and, and tried to block out. So I didn't have context for any of this stuff. In my mind, I kind of just thought that we did whatever we did while we were on earth. And that was, you know, the end of it. That's really what I felt at the time. And looking back, I can see that I was etherizing myself according to these lower impulses, um, according to like Luciferianism really. And, and it was, it was dark. It, it was all hedonistic. It was, it was all of these lower impulses and, and selfishness. And it really stems from this unresolved karma. And, and unresolved trauma. So um, I really liked that question because it, it made me think of that experience within this context, which is something that I hadn't previously done. But if you think about it, the ticks, I mean, what do they represent? Not just sucking the life out of you, but sucking blood out of you. And like I had said in my previous video, Steiner says that we used to have cosmic life within the nervous system and then that moved into the blood. So the blood is where we have our cosmic life and that cosmic life is necessary to go into the heart and to activate to Christ. So if we are releasing that, then it's absolutely going to affect etherization. Um, would it necessarily prevent it? No, we're going to be etherizing to something. That process is just naturally going to be happening either way but it could absolutely disrupt the process. And something else that I, that I think is really fascinating is that Steiner also talks about um, a blood double, which is essentially like a, um, a doppelganger of the blood that it furnishes within us um, like renewed strength and, and relieves us of things that are, are useless, things that we don't need, kind of like a filter. So if we are just opening our blood, if we are just releasing that cosmic life to everyone, it's going to disrupt an otherwise seamless process. And Steiner also says that blood is the principle whereby our eyehood is attained. And by eyehood, he is referring to our individuality, the process of, of knowing who we are, of developing our eye. And that that is also necessary in order to etherize. So I hope that that answer makes sense. Um, so if the question says, does self-harm cutting prevent etherization of the blood? I would say it doesn't, it doesn't prevent the etherization process, but I would say that um, it will disrupt the process of us etherizing with Christ. And that is a process that I think is 100% fixable and um, something that we can absolutely restore as we come into the heart. So moving on to the second question, which was about the long-term consequences to self-harming. So the second question said, are there any long-term consequences to self-harming? If it has been 10 years since you last did it, could it still be affecting you metaphysically or spiritually? Um, 
Yeah. So this, <laughs> this immediately, like all of these questions are, are immediately making me go back to my own life and experience. Um, and so again, like I said, I, I don't know everything. I'm, I'm going based off of what I have gotten from looking into my life and experiences. And, and I also do spiritual mentorship where I help other people move through these things. So I'm also going to be pulling from that. And also this question, all of all of the questions um, regarding karma, I, I always go back to Edgar Casey because I think that he just says so many good things about karma that really resonate with me and that have helped me a lot in my path. So the first thing that we should know and be aware of is that self-harm can trigger a lot of things within us so it's not necessarily that oh you know because you self-harmed in some way or because you cut yourself now you're marked and and you can't do anything about it you know it's it's not necessarily that um it's more so what the act of self-harm will actually do to us so if it has been 10 years since you lasted it could it still be affecting you metaphysically or spiritually um what, what I would say about that, I, I think the long-term consequences are um, things like shame, things like guilt, um, distrust around the body, distrust around yourself, feeling like you can't listen to yourself, um, fear uh, uh, or inability to, to take yourself seriously or, um, or even fear of taking action, actually, I would say. And the reason why is because when we have harmed ourselves in some way like that, it, um, it really does, it really does affect us. So even if, um, even if we have stopped you know, cutting ourselves or, or, or harming ourselves in a way that is overtly bad. What happens is that we still have the, these kind of unresolved impulses within us unless we get to the root of it. So if the karma isn't um, fully resolved and the expression of the self-harm may change, but it, it would still like remain present in the field, if that makes sense. Um, so something that, that I feel like is really true is that in order for karma to be um, resolved, whatever the karma is linked to or whatever the root is would have to be absolved. So if, if it was shame that um, is kind of like the leftover feeling, I know for me it was um, this feeling of shame, this feeling like I kind of deserved it or, or I deserved punishment or, or something like that. Um, definitely the feeling that I couldn't trust myself. I couldn't trust myself to make the right decisions. I couldn't trust myself to move forward and do things for myself that were going to be good. And in order to do that, I had to really repair my relationship with myself. So when we have done anything um, in, in a way where we have, where we're kind of sinning against ourselves, what we want to do is we have to repair that relationship. So think of think of it as if you are in a relationship or I mean, I don't mean like romantically, any kind of relationship. It could be um, parental. It could be a friendship, anything like that. You are in a relationship with another person and you harm them in some way. Now, is that going to affect your relationship moving forward? Well, that depends on what you do. That, de that depends on on what you do to repair it. Have you asked for forgiveness you know have you um have you made amends have you set out to show them how you feel about them now and let them know that you would never do that again it's important that we do that it's important that we make amends it's it's important that we go back and say i did this to you then because i didn't know any better or i did this to you then because i was in pain and I'm sorry, and I, and I hope that you can forgive me. And I want you to know that moving forward, I'm not going to do this again. And that moving forward, you can trust me. I feel like that's something that, that honestly helped me a lot in my own relationship with myself. Um, and it can be easier for us to do that sometimes if we kind of pair it with inner child work. And if you see yourself as a little child, it's like, how would you treat them? <laughs> you know, if you see yourself as a little child, I find for me as someone who's dealt a lot with shame and guilt and all of this stuff, it's kind of been easier for me to accept myself 
when I see myself that way. And when I look at myself through that lens, um, I was speaking to someone recently about how sometimes when we're in this state of traumatization, um, we can see things that we did as children through this adult lens. So something that you did when you were maybe like five, you could look at that and judge it as if you had an adult brain, as if you had adult faculties, as if you understood things from an adult perspective. And so we kind of grow up doing this because a lot of the times adults did that to us and they shamed us and they made us feel like we should know better when we had no way of knowing better. So it's really important to look back and say, you know, what I did when I was five was normal for five-year-olds uh, because I didn't know any better or, or what I did when I was 13 or what I did when I was 17. And, and um, I, didn't, I didn't have the full context and now I do. So I find that, that that's really helpful um, for me. And I also want to say that as for long-term consequences to um, self-harming, when, when we are unable to forgive ourselves, um, we can have entity attachments that where, where it's really like a thought form or an egregore that is created out of our deep emotional pain that is, it, it's now um, connected to or attached to this wound that we have, this wound of shame or of not trusting ourselves or of thinking like, I'm so stupid, I should have known better or whatever it may be. So that could also be something that we have left over is this kind of entity attachment. Um, and to deal with that, I mean, the best way to deal with that is, is to really honor and love yourself and free yourself. And in order to do that, we have to forgive the self and we have to be very, very gentle. I feel like I know, at least for me, you know, I was raised very harshly and, um, I didn't often feel like I was met with gentleness when I was going through something really difficult. It was like, you know, um, you disappointed us or you should have known better or everybody else knew this and you didn't know this. And it kind of creates all of this shame around you. And it makes it very difficult to be gentle with yourself when, when you didn't receive that growing up. But now you have the opportunity to be gentle with yourself and you have the opportunity to say, I'm going to do things differently and, and I am going to give myself this grace and I am going to give myself this gentleness that I was not given. So that's, that's what I would say about that. Um, another question that's kind of similar, but more uh, focused on future incarnations. This is one question that I basically got the same question um, from a few different people worded slightly differently, but, but mostly the same. So what are the karmic implications of self-harm and could the action of self-harming in one life have consequences in another? So what I want to say first is that anything that we, um, anything that we fail to integrate, we are going to perpetuate. So what I mean by that is that if, if we have this unresolved shame, if we have this unresolved guilt, you know, everything that I was just talking about, and we fail to actually forgive ourselves, we fail to be gentle with ourselves, we fail to be, to give ourselves grace. Um, we, we most likely will perpetuate that not only in this life, but, but those, those forces, that, that trauma, all of that would follow us over into our next incarnation. At least that's what I believe. Um, so something else that I wanted to say about that is that in the first video, I was talking about some of the metaphysical causes of self-harm. And some of the things that I said about that were directly related to karma. For example, I was saying that if you had a past life, where you were a martyr or where you, um, or, you know, where you did something really, really bad. And then in, in this incarnation, you know, if it was the martyr situation, then it would kind of be this act of, well, I'm going to self-harm because 
the harm that I bring to myself is going to help other people. It's going to save other people. That is something that I definitely um, related to and did. It, it was kind of this thing where if I was angry about anything, if I was upset about anything, I wanted to take it out on myself. I didn't want to hurt other people. Um, I didn't even want to be upset with other people. And something that I had to learn is that it's okay to be upset with other people. It's okay to be angry with other people. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's actually normal. <laughs> it's normal that if somebody hurts you, you would be upset with them for it. And that actually protects us. It doesn't mean that we have to hurt them. And it certainly doesn't mean that we have to hurt ourselves. But, but it's important to kind of have that intact within us um, so that we can protect ourselves, so that we can set correct boundaries, so that we can understand right from wrong. So... The other thing, if in a past life you, you did things that were very bad, which I also experienced, you can come into this life feeling this overwhelming feeling of like, I need to be punished. I deserve to be punished. This is also something that I've really, really dealt with. It's, it's been very personal to me, um, not just even the things that I did in my past lives, but in this life. I mean... I feel like I did some really bad things. I don't like thinking about the things that I did when I was on drugs. I don't like thinking about the things that I did when I was hurt and traumatized and dissociated because whether or not it was intentional and most of the time it was not intentional, I still ended up harming other people. And that was something that was really difficult for me to accept. It was really difficult for me to integrate. And for me, I, it was kind of like this, this nonstop thing of, I need to hurt myself so that I can relieve myself, so that I can relieve other people. And if I hurt myself, maybe I can somehow make up for it. So if you think about it, having things like that translate into this incarnation or whatever your current incarnation is as self-harm, what do you think that would look like moving forward in, in another incarnation? So some of the things that um, I was thinking of would be, I mean, hopefully if, if you have, if you stopped self-harming in this incarnation and then, um, and then pass over into the next one, I would see it as probably similar to the things that I was talking about of, um, the long-term consequences of self-harming, such as fear of self or, you know, inability to trust your own judgment. Um, but I was also thinking about this from like a physical perspective. And Edgar Casey talks a lot about physical illness, disability, things like that. And the way that um, it, it has been caused metaphysically, the way that um, it's been influenced karmically, and so much of that stems from unforgiveness. I mean, uh, it's it's an overwhelming amount of his readings take whatever the physical disability is or the illnesses, and it can be traced back to unforgiveness either from a previous incarnation or your current incarnation. And this doesn't have to be unforgiveness even with another person. It could be unforgiveness within yourself. So that's something that I feel like um, is a really big possibility. I think that if you are physically harming your divine human vessel in one life, I think, I think it's a, a very large possibility that going into another life um, that could bring sickness, disease, disability, all kinds of things like that. Um, or even, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but... But I've had certain situations before where something physical will happen and I will get like unexplained nausea around it. Um, and, it and it will just be like this overwhelming feeling. It, does, it doesn't feel like just a regular physical reaction. It feels spiritual. It feels like, um, like I am, it, there's almost like this dissociated feel to it where it feels like I'm remembering something that is too difficult to recall. And I have had that situation happen with, with certain physical things in the past. And when I say physical, I mean, it can be anything. It can be something like um, 
seeing, you know, an open wound can trigger that reaction. Um, seeing someone get stabbed, seeing someone get shot. Um, hopefully you're not seeing that in person, by the way, hopefully you're seeing that on, you know, in a, in a movie or something like that. But, um, yeah, and anything like that. If it if it triggers these um, uncomfortable feelings, this this feeling of nausea, this feeling of dissociation, I think that's um, also really possible. I feel like that that this could also translate karmically as severe codependency in relationships because of the inability to trust the self and feelings of needing to be guided through life. So that's what I would say there. And the last question was, do you have any techniques for reconditioning and replacing acts of self-harm with love? And I do. I have a lot to say about that one too. Okay, so where I would start there, first of all, it, it's really, really important to de shame. I, I would say that is the number one most important thing you could possibly do is, is to de shame. Now, that is not something that is easy to do. Um, I actually have been known to write scripts for de shaming. So recently, I actually um, was going through my jewelry box. And I am not really a big jewelry person. I wear my wedding ring and I don't really wear um, anything else. I sometimes wear a Fitbit. You just won't really see me with very much jewelry. So I'm not going in my jewelry box very often is, is where I'm going with this. And while I was going in there, I found a watch and I, I remembered that I had stolen it like years ago. And that's the difficult thing is, you know, for the most part, I tried to get rid of this stuff, but because it was so long ago, I just hadn't even remembered it. And when I remembered that it was stolen, I felt horrible. I felt in that moment, so much shame coming up and I just, I didn't even want it anymore. I didn't, I didn't want it in, in my presence. Um, and I started thinking about all the other things that I stole, which led me down, you know, that mindset of, you know, I was on so many drugs at the time and, and it's reminding me of all these other really bad things that I did. And what I did, the way that I handled that is I had to stop myself, you know, because it's not going to be helpful to continue down that path. I've changed my life. I'm not the same person anymore. And that is not going to be productive. That is not going to be beneficial. So what I did was I kind of went through this shame script where I said things to myself, like, I know things now that I didn't know back then. I have security now that I didn't have back then. I have support now that I didn't have back then. Back then, I was so broken. I didn't know myself at all. I was in so much pain. I didn't even want to be alive. I wasn't thinking about the long-term consequences. I wasn't thinking about the people that I was hurting. I was literally only thinking about anything I could do from moment to moment to make my life feel less miserable so that I, I would want to stay alive. And that doesn't serve as an excuse. <laughs> you know, my actions were very selfish back then and I fully own that. I know that they were, but I also wasn't selfish needlessly. You know, it, it wasn't for no reason. Um, and that's not just something I say to me. That's the case for most people. Most selfishness, in my opinion, and you know, I say most, not all. Um, most selfishness stems from such a deep wound stems from such deep trauma where we, we don't trust that God is going to take care of us. We don't trust that the universe is going to take care of us. We don't even believe that there's anything bigger than us. All we can see is our own pain. And to us, all that exists is, is what's around us is the material. And I was trying to meet spiritual needs and meet emotional needs. 
with these material things. And that obviously didn't work. And I got help. You know, I changed my life. I changed my actions. I took accountability and I'm not that person anymore. And I had to say to myself, I love you. Even though you did this, I love you. And I forgive you. And I'm sorry because you didn't have me then, but you have me now. And I'm not ever going to let that happen again. I'm going to take care of us. So I feel like having that kind of relationship with the self is really important. 